notes. Um, so if you need to um, leave early or if you're just really excited to watch this presentation again and again and again, it will be available for you to do that. So again, please check the CNPS, the California Native Plant Society YouTube page within a few days for this recording. All right, and during the webinar, um, please feel free to utilize the chat to share any comments with us. And please direct your questions for panelists or for Maya and myself um, into our Q&A feature. Okay, so let me introduce myself. I haven't even done that. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Aguilar. I'm the Community Education Coordinator with the California Native Plant Society. And with me today, I have Maya. Maya, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Maya Argamon, and I am the um, Horticulture Senior Program Coordinator at CNPS. That's always a mouthful for me to say. Um, and yeah, I'm based in San Francisco in the sunset, so um, really excited to hear everybody talk about dry gardening, um, very applicable to, you know, the drought that we're in, and just really excited to introduce everybody as well. So thanks all for being here. Thank you, Maya. Okay, so as Maya mentioned, we're so excited to focus in on dry gardens this month, and we have three very wonderful speakers here to share more about their experience and their familiarity with dry gardens and highlight some of the amazing drought tolerant plants that do well in these spaces. So let's let's just get into it. There's lots to share, lots to see, lots to learn. Um, so I wanna introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Cricket Riley. So Cricket Riley is the Interim Executive Director and Landscape Design Services Director at the Ruth Bancroft Garden. So plant-centered design is the focus of all of Cricket's work at the garden, from designing gardens to giving workshops, from writing about plants in the newsletter to ordering plants for the nursery, educating people on the beauty, diversity, and sustainability of regionally appropriate, appropriate plants is always her goal. Your garden should look good, feel good, and do good. If we've accomplished those three things, then we are successful. Sorry, lost my note. Then we are uh, successful. Cricket has an AA in landscape architecture from Merritt College, a BA in history from UC Santa Cruz, and an MA in broadcast journalism and Near Eastern studies from NYU. So please join me in welcoming Cricket. Cricket, please take it away. Hello, good evening. So fun to be here with so many people. It's very exciting. We do uh, webinars here with Bancroft all the time, but we don't nearly get this many participants. So this is very exciting. Summer fun party. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Ruth Bancroft Garden today and then highlight 10 succulents that I think are really wonderful for use in dry garden design. Um, Eight of them, I believe, are California natives. I wanted to try to use as many California natives for this talk as possible, but there are two Mexican succulents that I included just to kind of round things out with design principles and the ideas of color and shape and what plants do in a design. Um, first, I'm gonna take just a couple minutes to talk about Ruth Bancroft Garden. I don't know how familiar our audience is. Um, so Ruth Bancroft Garden is in Walnut Creek, California. We are in the San Francisco Bay Area, sort of the eastern edge of the Bay Area. And our garden was established by Ruth Bancroft in the early 1970s. Um, she was an avid gardener for all of her life. And at that point was in her early 60s when she started the garden. It was on the family um, walnut and pear orchard that had been here for since the late 1800s. So these were 400 acres of agricultural land that were then sort of over the years taken over by housing developments and leaving the family with 11 acres. And that is when she started her garden. It became uh, the founding garden of the Garden Conservancy and continues today um, as this sort of dry garden oasis. We kind of call it a hidden jewel. It is a three and a half acre dry garden open to the public. We're open six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday. I have to like think about what days. Um, and we have all sorts of different services. 
and classes. There is the garden itself, which is this amazing um, dry garden design done by Ruth that has sort of grown and changed over the years, but always guiding by her principles. We also have children's programming. We have webinars and certificate programs. We have lots of events. We have a large retail nursery and we only sell low and very low water plants. Um, an interesting thing about the garden and something that I'm gonna touch on as I go through this talk is Walnut Creek is not like uh, the rest. When people think of the Bay Area, they think of sort of cloudy and cold, maybe some sun in certain spots, but we are on the other side of a range of hills that condition gives us a very different garden condition. So we have extreme heat in the summer. We can have a week at a time where it's over a hundred. And in the winter, we get colds down into 25, sometimes even 20 degrees. This last winter, we had a particularly cold spell where it got into 25 for several nights and we did get some damage. So the plants that we plant, the plants that we sell in our nursery, the plants that the design services, which is the department that I run, spec for people's gardens are all plants that can sort of survive these extremes because that's something that we're all finding we have to deal with more and more. So finding plants, using plants, and learning to create beautiful gardens with things that require low water and can survive in extremes of heat and cold is something that we should all be doing. It's the responsible thing to do. And I think that here at Ruth Bancroft, we really demonstrate that you can still have these beautiful, vibrant, lush, interesting gardens while taking into account all of those factors. So I'm gonna start talking about some of these plants. Um, first plant I wanna speak about tonight is the sedum Cape Blanco. This is a California native sedum. One of the fun things about this plant is that the leaves are edible. So you can add it to stir fries or salads or anything like that. It's also a very beautiful, as you can see, silvery blue succulent. So really nice in small scale settings like rock gardens or container gardens. It's fairly cold tolerant. Um, so it can survive in a lot of different conditions. I would, however, plant it sort of with some protection in your more inland region. So I'm sure there's people tuning in from all parts of California, but if you're in those regions where we get that, that summer heat, you might want to give it a little bit of protection from the sun um, in, the, in the summertime. So what we would say is you protect it from afternoon sun. It's safe. Um, the next are Dudleyas. These are California natives. There are also a lot of lovely Dudleyas. The most popular Dudleya that we see sold in the nursery trade is Dudleya bretonii, which is not a California native, but all of these Dudleyas here are. The Dudleya virens is the most sensitive of the three. It should get some protection from the afternoon sun, and it is a little bit more frost tender, but the edulis and the lanceolata are both fairly cold tolerant, so down to like 15, 10 degrees. Um, so if you're living in some, somewhere that has those, those cold temperatures and you want this sort of nice, grassy, soft succulent, these are great options for you to use. Um, the edulis is also fairly heat tolerant as well. I think the lanceolata as well, but they, they have that both cold and heat tolerance that the virens doesn't have. Um, I think that all of the Dudleyas are planted really lovely when you use them in masses. So planting multiple specimens in a bed with boulders and outcroppings really creates that lovely sort of silvery, grassy texture, but with a succulent form. Another really beautiful succulent is the Luisia cotyledon. This I think is really grown for the flowers, which come in the late spring, early summer. I would think that this plant would work best in sort of a rock garden tucked into the little boulders, as you can see here in this, this photo here. So just if you had that rocky wall or um, <clears throat> any sort of small garden bed, excuse me, 
and planted multiples, it would do really well. But you really want to grow it where you can enjoy those flowers when they come out in the spring. And you can see those here. Also, that makes it great for a dish garden. So if you're making a small composition and you want that pizzazz that pops out, I would just be considerate of planting it with things that are going to provide some visual interest when those flowers die back, because it's not something that, like a lot of succulents I'm going to talk about today, has a lot of interest in those leaves. It comes from the north northern part of California um, in the in a mount, mountainous, more mountainous region. So it is incredibly cold tolerant, which is a really great thing in a succulent. All right, another very cold tolerant succulent is agave utahensis. There are not that many agaves that are native to California. Um, most of them are from Mexico, but utahensis is one of those. We do grow this here at Ruth Bancroft. It is a little bit tricky to grow because it requires very sharp drainage. It doesn't like a lot of uh, winter rain. So one of the things that we've had to do here to adapt the dry garden palette, a lot of the plants that we grow to our area is soil amendment. Um, they, plants can be drought tolerant, but <clears throat> really not want to have wet winter roots, right? It's just part of where they come from doesn't have that winter rain. So providing that sharp drainage, mixing that into if you had clay soils, mixing that in so that you can get that sharp drainage. So if it does get wet in the winter, that water goes off quickly is a key factor. One of the reasons you would grow this plant, of course, is because of those beautiful spines, right? Um, it's very, fairly solitary. It may pup a little bit, but it is a fairly solitary plant which makes it very much a specimen plant. Um, you can really, it really captures the bed, draws your eye in. It's that focal point that you're looking at in a design. And because also of it's, it's not gonna grow too big, two to three feet high and wide at most, then it's also really good for a container plant. Another California native agave is agave shia. This one is much easier to grow. It's actually fairly um, clay tolerant and it's really remarkable grown for those beautiful spines, right? So those leaf margins are really beautiful as well as, as you can see here, the imprint that they make on the leaf. This one is usually about three feet high and wide. Um, and it has a beautiful dark, those dark green leaves, I think as makes a really nice composition with that, the contrast with the, the brown of the leaf margin. It does clump some. So if you want a neat solitary specimen, it might not be the best one for you. You will have to go in there and clean out those pups if you wanna have a solitary specimen, but it does cover a nice amount of area. So. If you had a region, I think it would be nice sort of up on a hill. You don't want to have to do a lot of gardening, very low maintenance, but you give it room to grow. It'll create a nice outcropping. And it is very cold and heat tolerant. Okay. Hesper yucca whippoli, also sometimes known as yucca whippoli. You'll see these gr growing along the side of the five on the grapevine. And they are really very in the leaf color and both the size. We have some specimens growing here at Ruth Bancroft that have flowered um, at only two feet high and wide. Others, you can they can grow up to 12 feet high and wide. So there's a wide variety of size and also of color. They're, when you can find them and they have this beautiful blue silvery color, you should definitely get it. Incredibly drought tolerant incredibly cold tolerant, really easy to grow, and just providing that soft focal point plant, right? It has a sort of a grassy soft texture that really draws the eye in, but doesn't give that sharpness. So I'll have clients that will say, oh, I don't like anything that's too spiny or too sharp. And this would be a good option for them because it looks soft. It has that soft feel but it's going to be incredibly drought and cold tolerant. They are monocarpic, however, so once they bloom, they will die. That can happen after 
10 years or that can happen after 30 years that we've seen both here at Ruth Bancroft. So just be prepared for that, but it's a lovely uh, yucca to introduce into your garden. Now, on a very different note is the Fucaria splendens, also known as the Ocotillo. You see these all over uh, Joshua Tree, and Palm Springs, and they're very interesting sculptural plants. They, there's a period of time where they are deciduous and the leaves fall off and they just look like these dead prickly sticks, but then they get some water and the leaves come out and you get these wonderful wands. They can grow quite large, um, 15, 20 feet high, eight feet wide, but really quite beautiful and remarkable. This is for something, somebody that wants either a desert garden or wants a kind of modern garden. A grouping of these is really beautiful, really eye-catching. They are very sharp, however. So if somebody doesn't want spiny plants, it's not the plant for them. But if somebody wants something that has a lot of drama and you have the room for it, then this would be a fantastic plant. It does fairly well in a container, but really it's important that you give it the space to grow to its proper size. I, if you have a small space, this is probably not the best plant. Fair cactus. This is the San Diego barrel cactus. Um, it's really lovely because it only grows to about one foot high and wide. So it's going to stay fairly compact. These spines you can see here can sometimes be quite red, which makes it really beautiful. Um, it needs sharp drainage, but it is fairly tolerant of winter water. So that's something that's really nice about it. When I would plant this, I would definitely plant it in masses. So plant several of these in a space, repeat it through a garden. But it, those barrels are so lovely in garden design. I think even when mixed within a non-traditional way, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a desert garden. You can mix in some leucodendron and have these nice little barrels in front of it and it would be a really beautiful composition. Pachycerus pringoli. I think that having a nice statement plant in any garden or what we call a sentry. So this is planted here right by the front garden, um, by the front gate at Ruth Bancroft. And it sort of, it, it stands sentry, right? It's a, it's a wayfaring mark, so you know where to enter, and it is a really beautiful uh, columnar cacti. It is the tallest growing columnar cacti. They, in nature, have been found to grow up to 60 feet high. Usually, they go to about 20 or 30 feet. They're known to be slow growing, but we have found here at Ruth Bancroft that they do have a moderate growth rate. They can, they'll put on several feet of, over a couple of years. So that's a good thing to know that even though you read about them being slow growing, they do grow fairly fast. They have that wonderful blue color to them. And they, we've, they've done just fine with us hitting temperatures of 25 degrees. So that's something that is really important. Lastly today, I wanna to talk about Echeveria Conte. This is an Echeveria from Mexico, just like the Pachycerus pringle, I'm sorry, that is also from Mexico. So um, California adjacent, that's from Baja. Uh, this Echeveria is a beautiful Echeveria that we grow a lot of here at Ruth Bancroft. It is fairly cold tolerant, which is quite nice. Some Echeverias, cannot do so well in the cold, but this one is fairly cold tolerant, especially if given that sharp drainage and it has that beautiful ghostly lavender white appearance. It gets to be a really nice landscape size, about 12 to 18 inches across. And it is available in the nursery trade. Currently Suncrest Nurseries seems to have it on a fairly regular basis. So this is something that you can get for your garden. Uh, when it blooms, I really like the blooms and they stay on the plant for several months. So you get those wonderful pink frilly blooms, spring into summer, and then all year long, you get those wonderful silvery purpley blue glaucus leaves. 
that's all I have for today. Great, thank you, Cricket. Um, really quick, we had some questions about the sharp drainage and what what are you referring that to oh, in of terms course. of soil yeah. type and what amendments for that? Yeah. Yeah, so something that we're always talking about is the best success you're gonna have with your plants is if you first work with your soil, right? You have to think about soil, water, and exposure. For soil, sharp drainage, means mixing in mineral content. So that can be sand or volcanic rock. Um, volcanic rock can either be pumice or red lava. Anywhere from, we usually say to, to avoid sand because it's heavy and to use either pumice or volcanic rock anywhere from a quarter inch to up to three quarters inch, although that can be kind of big. For these types of plants, we recommend if you have clay, you mix in a 50% of your native clay to 50% of this volcanic rock to create that sharp drainage and just get the water so that it doesn't sit in the roots. Does that answer? Wonderful. Yes, yes, okay, thank good. you. <laughs> Thank you, Cricket. Of Thank course. you for sharing so much wonderful information and so many beautiful photos. We did get a lot of um, oohs and ahs about those. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have Katie Newman. So Katie Newman is the sales and marketing manager at Tree of Life Nursery, where she is specialized in guiding wholesale and retail customers to successful horticultural choices over the, the last three years. She grew to appreciate the importance of native plants during her time working with the National Park Service and volunteering for the Newport Bay Conservancy. So welcome, Katie, and please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen with y'all so you can see my pretty presentation. Okay. So as she mentioned, I am the sales and marketing manager at Tree of Life Nursery. We are a wholesale and retail plant nursery located in San Juan Capistrano in Southern California. And we also do landscape design, landscape consultations. We have a really wonderful workshop series. We do a couple workshops per month and we try to upload all of those to our YouTube channel. We have a really great blog with tons of information about planting California native plants plant lists if you live near the coast or you live inland, um, you can typically find it on our blog. So definitely check that out. And I'm going to be talking about summer dry gardening with California native plants today. And the reason we grow and use native plants with our summer dry gardens is because they've evolved with California's unique climate. So that means that they're pretty adapted to those really long dry summers. They don't need a lot of supplemental irrigation in those summer months. Um, but just because there are some California native plants that go dormant during these summer months in order to save water, um, doesn't mean that you can't also have some summer color. There's tons of California native plants that actually bloom in those summer months. California native plants also provide habitat for our native fauna. So we have tons of native birds, butterflies, bees, lizards that all live off of California native plants and require them for food and shelter. Um, and my favorite part of planting California native plants is that it gives me a sense of place. And I know that it's my small way of being able to give back to this land that I occupy, knowing that I'm providing some habitat and giving back um, in just a small way. Um, my other favorite part of California native gardens and summer dry gardens is that, you know, here in Southern California, especially, we can really enjoy our gardens all year round. Um, planting season for native plants is fall, typically, and that's because we want to take advantage of the rainy season. So we get those plants, new plants in the ground, um, and then we don't have to use as much supplemental irrigation because we can use rainfall when it comes down in the winter and sometimes even in the spring. Didn't get a lot this year, but we got a little bit. Um, and then we can just really enjoy our gardens in those summer months when it's really hot and we don't really want to be doing a ton of labor in our yards and pruning and weeding and all of that. Um, 
this picture is of a tree of life um, design and install. There's our customers just engaging in their natural garden, watching all of the beautiful plants sway in the wind, a lot of pollinators buzzing in front of them. Um, and other ways that you can engage in your garden, you know, doing artwork, doing yoga, meditation, prayer, journaling. There's a number of ways that you can engage in your garden in the summer months that doesn't involve tons of watering and, you know, mowing and, you know, taking tons of you know, appliances out and making lots of noise in your garden. My favorite way is really getting into the small of my garden. So turning over leaves and seeing what kind of habitat I'm creating. So, um, you know, right now in the summer months, milkweed is really prolific in the gardens. They're out of dormancy and the monarchs are here. They're laying eggs on the milkweed the caterpillars are showing up. And so I love just going out and turning over leaves on the milkweed and trying to find, you know, caterpillar eggs or caterpillars. Finding a chrysalis in the garden is always like finding a small treasure. Um, one of my favorite plants in my personal garden is Malva astringentiflora. It's a mallow that's native to Catalina Island. I think there's a couple. The, the one I have is native to Catalina. Um, and I go out and look at it every day during the summer months because it puts on new blooms constantly throughout the spring and the summer. And they're really prolific, beautiful blooms. Um, and that, you know, bloom is what attracts me to it. But yesterday I noticed that there was tons of holes all over my um, Malva plant. And I just had it, I was like, I'm not gonna engage in my garden today. I don't wanna know what's going on. I'm just gonna leave it for now. My boss comes over for dinner last night and says, Katie, you have dozens of baby um, grasshoppers all over your <laughs> Malva plant. And then I felt bad, you know, I'm looking at these tiny grasshoppers and they're so cute that, you know, I don't want to, you know, worry about them. I wanna let them enjoy the Malva. I'm not mad that they're eating the leaves cause they're so cute. And I know that tomorrow, those grasshoppers are probably going to become food for some native California birds. Um, sad, but it's part of the natural life cycle and part of why we're planting native plants is to create habitat. Okay. Sorry, one second. So if you don't already have a native plant garden or a natural gar California garden or a summer dry garden, a great way to get inspiration is to get outside, go hit the trails, um, find native habitat that speaks to you that you would love to bring home, kind of like a little postcard. Um, you know, I love going out into the Newport Back Bay. That's where I fell in love with native plants is volunteering for my local conservancy. Um, going out on the trails with my friend Cheryl over there on the right. I love seeing that bay laurel and that California lilac creating kind of a natural tunnel. I mean, that would just be so fun to bring home into your own natural garden someday. But I also know that not everyone can get outside. Um, there's a lot of things that restrict us from getting out onto the trails, especially right now. Gas is a big thing for a lot of people. Um, but there's other ways that we can find inspiration and get started with our natural garden um, from the comfort of our own home. And a few ways that I love to do that is, you know, the Tree of Life blog, there's tons of information on there. You can find tons of information on the California Native Plant Society blog. Um, pretty much anything you need to know about planting California native plants, you can find on the Tree of Life Nursery blog. Um, and we have links to all of our YouTube workshops on there as well. So if, if reading's not your favorite thing in the world, you can watch someone talk to you about it instead. Um, I love listening to podcasts. Cultivating Place is one of my favorites right now. Jennifer Jewell is the podcast host and she interviews people from all over the world really. And it's inspiring to me because I like listening to how other people choose to engage in their gardens. You know, whether or not they're planting California native plants, there's still a lot that we can learn from other gardeners no matter where they are in the world. Um, and it just makes me, you know, want to try new things and get out in my garden a little bit more often. 
Magazines and books are another great way to do it, especially now in the summer months, our native plant nurseries might be having some slow sales. So a great way to support them is by purchasing books um, or magazines. I love this Wonderground journal. Um, I bought this one, it's a quarterly journal and I bought it from Plant Material in Los Angeles on their online shop. And the stories in it and the interviews that they do with people from all over the world are really unique and just really inspiring. And just, it's a lot of different people and the way that not, they not only connect in their gardens, but they connect to nature in general. Um, so if that's something you're interested, definitely check it out. Poetry is another great way to find inspiration for your native garden love a YouTube. Um, I love watching videos and kind of just, you know, going on adventures with other people. My coworker, Kevin Allison has SV Californica. That's his YouTube channel for his um, sailing adventures. He sails around the Channel Islands in Southern California and kind of takes you on the journey with him. And he talks about the native fauna and flora that he finds along his journey. Elemental Designs, they have a few videos up now and I've actually started using them um, to give to my customers who ask me for advice on incorporating plants into a school garden or he has a really cool video on um, uh, bringing native plants into more of a permaculture garden. So I'm not really familiar with permaculture, but it's really cool that there's people out there that are, you know, combining native plants into, you know, food gardens and stuff like that. So, you know, you don't have to be a fully native garden to enjoy native plants. And social media, of course, um, I've found a lot of really cool, you know, conservancies and national parks. They all do really educational stuff on their social media. You can follow hashtags to find new accounts to follow and learn from other gardeners that might have been doing it for longer than you. Maybe they failed at something and they're teaching you a lesson. Um, I also took a class from Nick Hummingbird. Um, his Instagram's California underscore native plants, I think. Um, but his classes are really informational and he usually has a very small, um, he keeps his class size small. So when you ask questions, you get really detailed responses from him, which I find helpful. Um, and so yeah, those are just some of the ways that I've been finding inspiration since I haven't really been able to get out into nature uh, myself lately, besides my, my own garden. So once you're engaging or you're finding inspiration, it's time to start planning. The most essential thing you can do before you start your native garden or before you add to your native garden is follow up and make sure that you're familiar with how to water a native plant garden because it's going to be different than a tropical garden or, you know, your lawn that you might have been used to watering, you know, four times a week. Um, on our website, the Tree of Life website, CaliforniaNativePlants.com, you can find really detailed watering guide for download. You can watch our wa How to Water Native Plants video on our YouTube, and you can go to calscape.org through CNPS to find plants that are regionally appropriate for your area. Um, so getting familiar with your own garden, its microclimates, knowing how to plant a plant correctly, these are all gonna be kind of basic functions before you pick out your plants. So going based off of that, I went on the Tree of Life Nursery blog and I found a few different blogs. One was a plant list for coastal gardens. I found a plant list for intermediate gardens and a plant list for inland gardens. And then I said, okay, from these lists, I wanna narrow it down. I wanna find plants that are gonna be really beneficial for pollinators and butterflies, um, bees and butterflies. I want stuff that can handle good drainage, sharp drainage. I wanna find a plant that's gonna be blooming and showing a lot of color in the summer months when maybe some of my other plants are dormant, looking a little brown. Um, and so I found these. Monardella is really great if you live near the coast for full sun. You can plant it inland, but it's gonna need a little bit more shade. Bladder pod for those intermediate areas. You're not quite at the coast, but you're not super inland in the desert. And bladder pod is just like an all-star plant. It pretty much blooms all year round. So highly recommend it for all gardens. And then we've got our Sphoralsia ambigua, the globe mallow. This is a really great plant for pollinators and it's really showy in the summer months. 
It can really take a lot of heat um, and it puts on a pretty spectacular show in the summer. And then it'll start to kind of turn yellow or brownish towards the end of summer, beginning of fall. So last but not least, um, what I really want you to understand about a summer dry garden and using native plants for your summer dry garden is that it's an investment. Um, you're gonna go to a native plant nursery and you might be shocked to find that there's not a lot of larger sizes of plants. And that's because native plants tend to establish better in a new environment when they're planted from a smaller container. The roots are younger, they're more adaptable. Um, they're gonna adapt to that new uh, environment faster and they're gonna grow faster in the garden when planted from a smaller container. So you can plant a five gallon Sambucus next to a one gallon Sambucus and watch them both kind of creep along. Within a year, they'll probably both be the same size. So the garden in the picture on the left, that was um, planted in fall of 2020. And um, you can see they're all pretty small containers. There's a lot of mulch. It does, it's not showing you instant gratification of a beautiful flourishing native garden, right? But then on the right, that's the same garden only a year later. And you can see how much growth it's put on. It's blooming, it's looking wonderful, it's looking lush, and it's only gonna get better from there. And one more thing is with your investment also comes time. We mentioned that fall is the best time to plant native plants, but that doesn't necessarily mean every plant on your dream wish list is gonna be available in the fall. Just like fall is the best time for planting in the garden, it's also a really great time for the nurseries to start growing, sowing seed, um, doing more cuttings for plants. So those plants might not be available until uh, winter or early spring. So just keep that in mind when you go to the nursery, be open to substitutes, be open to maybe waiting a couple months and saving a spot in the garden for that plant that you really want and you really love. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katie. That was a really inspiring presentation and a great way to just become familiar with our, with our own gardens. Lots of different tips and tricks there for us to connect with the spaces that we have. All right. And now we have uh, Joanna Silver. Um, so Joanna is a James Beard award-winning award author who writes mostly about plants and people. Her two books, The Bold Dry Garden, Lessons from the Ruth Bancroft Garden, and Growing Weed in the Garden, A No Fuss, Seed to Stash Guide to Outdoor Cannabis Cultivation, are available everywhere books are sold. Joanna is a contributing editor at Better Homes and Gardens, and her, and her work has been featured in Martha Stewart Living, The San Francisco Chronicle, and Eating Well. Previously, Joanna spent 10 years at Sunset Magazine, beginning with a shovel in her hands and culminating as head of the garden department. She currently lives in, she lives in gardens in Berkeley, where she grows fruits, veggies, and entirely too many cut flowers. So please join me in welcoming Joanna. Joanna, please take it away. Thank you so much. Let me do the little awkwardness of sharing my screen, and then I can talk to you. There we go. So hello. Um, loved the two presentations that went before. And um, yeah, let's just get straight to it. This is these are just two pretty pictures. And the disco ball made me laugh, which is definitely a low water, um, low water addition to your garden. Oh, okay. So yeah, 10 years at Sunset Magazine. I've been in a lot of a lot of dry gardens. Um, and had the extreme um, honor of writing um, a book about the Ruth Bancroft Garden, um, which is sort of equal parts story about Ruth and her approach to gardening, and then all the plants that she uses and how the garden is evolving. And so that would be another way, if you can't get to the garden, you could buy the book and help support the garden. Um, and then, my career took a strange pivot into um, cannabis gardening, and that is my second book over there on the right. But we're here to talk about dry gardens, and we don't mean this hideous 
lawn and hilariously topiaried um, bushes, which I think it's just a huge, I mean, I think most of us know it's just a huge change of your mental paradigm to, to garden in California. And it can be as simple as retaining these um, principles of, of gardens from other places like the front lawn, but just using something like a mo-free native fescue mix, or uh, this is a, this is the mo-free from Delta Bluegrass, which gosh, years ago was only available by seed or plug and now is available in sod form. And it's, you know, once a week irrigation. And these are just some of my favorite plants. Again, keeping with that sort of traditional, you know, you have a grass. This is Carex divulsa on the bottom left, just as a grass and Ceanothus as hedging and Fremontodendron or Agaria elliptica as these big, beautiful specimen plants. Um, or we can get a little funkier. And um, these are four books that are that I have been living by in the last stretch of time. Um, Designing California Native Gardens has been hugely helpful to me as I have redone my own backyard as a renter, mind you. Um, so spending lots of money on a yard that ultimately isn't mine, but it, it really helps distill these um, ecosystems that, that occur naturally in California so that when you're going to the nursery, you're looking to um, inhabit your, your land with what maybe would have been there or might still be there. Um, of course, acknowledging, plant, I'm jumping over now to planting in a post wild world, acknowledging that there is no going back to what was. Um, but why I love this book is it speaks about really planting um, plant communities that so it's different than like the lawn and the foundation plants and the trees, but how can you plant something that really supports itself over time. Um, gardening in summer dry climates is of course a brilliant book for those of us in Mediterranean dry summer climates, just a plant encyclopedia. And then the American Meadow, I have been using it. It's John Greenlee, who's like the grass god, not entirely native, um, but really great principles on how to create a meadow, which I think is sort of of the moment. And um, in my own backyard, I have, been trying to create a bit of a meadow with a mix of native grasses. I was telling the ladies on our pre-call the other day that I, of course, didn't keep the labels, didn't keep track of where I put anything. So now I have these beautiful grasses going off with all sorts of different seed heads, and I can't tell you which one is which. And I once heard John Greenlee say that um, a meadow is just a, an excuse for for, um, for flowers. And that's basically what I'm doing too. So just lots of poppies and Clarkia and California fuchsia. And I have to think what else is out there and just sparse this year and hoping that they take off in the coming years. This is a much more modest garden. Um, you know, at sunset, there were so many that were uh, really not achievable. And so this one I love because it's just a little, little tiny craftsman, which is so common in the area where I live, planted with a bunch of extremely low water plants. And this was actually out of the sunset plant line. And though I don't work there anymore, I will forever talk so well about the plant line curated by a horticulturalist named Janet Sluice, who worked so hard to bring dry plants um, into mainstream cultivation. So you can look for the sunset plant line anywhere. And there's a, there are some natives, this is a native Ceanothus tucked in there. Um, and just some other details as we think about how to make our garden sustainable. This rain barrel is a great example. Um, now sort of just thinking about Katie's presentation and where you find inspiration. For me, this time of year, I'm just stalking my favorite designers 
which tend to work on a much higher budget than is anything I could ever possibly achieve. But I like to look through their pictures, like this one is from Terremoto uh, Landscape Architects, and they work both in Northern and Southern California. And I am just sort of obsessed with their look of blending cultivated and wild. And so I'll go through these plants and, you know, look at this, um, the grasses and ID them and the aeoniums and the lavender and the melianthus and they always use a mix of native and non-native and I'll sort of think about how to apply that into my own garden. This is also terremoto and you'll see a theme of where my mind is at these days with again this blurring the line of um, wild and cultivated. I am I have a bunch of agave, but only attenuata, only the ones without succulent, without spines, because I am the mother to a um, almost five-year-old and I'm not looking for any ER visits from spines. And this is um, Dune High, another local landscape architect. If you can tell again how much I'm into a certain look right now of this sort of wild, um, the, you know, these are simple scabiosa mixed in with, with native grasses, et cetera. And this is talc studio, just a, a third one that's in the Bay Area that I am feeling very obsessed with these days. Oh, I wanted, so this is a lovely story that um, ended up running in Better Homes and Gardens and uh, about the California pipe vine, which is where I learned that we need more than nectar plants for our butterflies, but we also need their host plants as I saw a lively chat about Asclepius, about milkweed. Um, and this is, these are gorgeous pictures and this is great for a magazine, but of course these are the pictures that nobody wants to publish, but there is this sort of messier side to native gardening or to habitat gardening, which is that you need the, the you need this sort of messier parts. You need the branches where they'll form their, um, their chrysalis and, and you need to leave some of this dried stuff from last year for the new stuff to regrow. And so, you know, it's interesting this year in my own yard, I found um, there were just these logs that had been left. And I went to see like, am I gonna move them? What are they doing here? And there were all of these um, salamanders hiding in them in winter. And so just starting to appreciate having wilder, less touched parts of my own backyard. Oh, and this is just my reminder. These are both pictures from the Ruth Bancroft garden. Um, in my own journey, I um, am, am learning that we need to leave room for things to grow. Um, and my version of this in my own yard is Matilla poppies, which the landlord planted before I moved in. And they're, they were so nice in their nice little corner for several years. And now, wow, they are completely taking over. And so there is this thing with native plants that I've heard before, sleep, creep, leap, which is what they'll do in three years or a little bit more. And these as Katie was saying, they start really, really small and then they just, they just boom. Um, and it's really exciting to see and a little bit overwhelming. And I just wanted to plug, if you're local to the Bay Area, in addition to the amazing nursery at the Ruth Brancroft Garden itself, um, we also have several native specific nurseries. There's Oak Town, uh, which is right across from Vic's Chot House in Berkeley on 4th Street. And it's, it's a pretty epic place, um, small, tiny, tiny things, but it will, they tell you where each plant comes from, what, what type of, um, native, like what type of native landscape these plants are found originally. And then of course, Bay Natives over in the Bayview. And, oh, I think that was it. Um, let me stop sharing short and sweet, but gives us a little bit of time to go back to a panel, um, a panel discussion. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Joanna. That was such a wonderful presentation. A lot of great design and just inspiration for all of us as we start to think about our spaces and how to interact and and design all of those. All right, so we're going to get into our panel discussion. We have a few minutes for that. Um, 
So yeah, let's just get into it. And for all of our panelists, please feel free to jump in at any point, uh, share what you wanna share. These are just kind of leading questions for us, but I wanted to start out with a really tough one. <laughs> Favorite dry garden plant and why? There were some very beautiful images you all showed. Any of those that you highlighted today are, are a favorite of yours? I'm into salvia clevelandii, just the native salvia, super, super silvy, silver with those purple blooms. And I, in my dreams, I don't have a small space garden. I have a huge garden and there's just like a huge swath of them. Um, instead, I have like three that are fighting for their lives. Yeah, they smell incredible. I have some in my backyard too. And they just, yeah, they smell so good. So salvias are wonderful plants. Um, I agree. My favorite is Mirabilis lavis, um, desert wishbone bush or desert four o'clock. Um, it just has these tiny little purple flowers and it's this really you know, giant ground cover, kind of mid-sized ground cover plant that gets really beautiful lush green leaves on it. Um, with supplemental water, it won't go dormant in the summer, but um, it will turn a little bit brown if you just let it go completely dry in the summer months. Um, it's just really cute. And also my tortoise enjoys eating it. So it's my favorite. Um sort of two different. I, the first thing I think of when you say what's your favorite is a yucca rostrata, which is not a California native plant, but is such a wonderful plant and such a wonderful sort of investment in your garden that will give you beauty for many years. But for a California native plant sort of on the completely different scale, um, I love California poppies, but the in different colors. So like I'm in the process right now of in my own front garden, trying to seed and reseed the buttermilk, which is this really beautiful kind of creamy colored California poppy. And if you let it go to seed, then it'll, you know, they go dormant and they look scrappy and you can cut them back. But then the next year they come out and you have in the springtime, just this wonderful carpet of these creamy, pretty California poppies and, um, it's full sun, hard, unamended clay, and they just come in and look so sweet. So they're really wonderful. Can I address um, some uh, something that somebody brought up in the chat? It was wanting us to address um, how we feel about native plants in light of climate change. Um, and I wanted to say that back when I worked at the magazine, it was real fun to be more, um, like inflammatory and clickbaity about these topics. And I remember once I spent the day with a very renowned oak person who said something like, native plant people are nothing short of climate change deniers because of um, how climate is changing. And I thought, wow, that would get a lot of clicks. Um, but I think it doesn't actually serve us to be pitted against one another. Um, the truth is we don't know. We are in huge habitat loss. That, that can't be denied. We've had immense habitat loss. And so I think doing whatever you can to support the birds and the bees in your area, and that might be just having nectar plants. And that's where you're starting is having nectar plants for all the promiscuous pollinators. Or maybe you take it deeper and you, um, you know, plant certain host plants and you know, um, my husband is, is always sending me articles about new bacteria that's starting to break down styrofoam. So this idea of life evolving in these ways that we don't know how it's all going to play out, but there is just immense habitat loss. And so I think, I think that anything you can do to add a little bit more wild and a little bit of nectar and a little bit of habitat, but you know, maybe it's a branch on your tree that's died and you leave it for the birds to make their nest, just little things. Um, I, I'm not, I'm no longer interested in like inflammatory arguments on one side or another side. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, it's like any little, any little change matters, you know, replacing one plant, replacing your lawn with native plants, or just replacing your lawn in general, like there's just little things make a big difference. So 
Thanks for sharing. Wonderful. Um, maybe we can move on to our next question yeah. or if Cricket or Katie have anything to add. Um, we just wanted to kind of bring out too for those folks that are that are new joining us or new to uh, native plants or dry gardens, what how would you describe what drought tolerant means and why would native plants be an important component to a drought tolerant garden space or dry garden space? Um, I will start there. We actually try to use the term water wise more than drought tolerant. Um, the, the idea is not necessarily, we can't predict like drought anymore. It feels like it's all unpredictable right here in Walnut Creek. And we had a hundred degree temperatures in early June and then it got cold and things, it's just all over the place. So trying to just be conservative in how we use resources, all resources, right? What trash we produce, what water we use, all of it, and looking at our gardens in those same ways, right? So like, let's just try to be respectful and conservative. And that I think is part of what drought tolerant means. And in addition, planting plants that will be successful so you don't have to replant, right? We, we shouldn't be just throwing plants in and trying them out and seeing what happens when we can, sort of lean into native plants or adapted plants. So plants that are adapted to your area. So they don't have to be from California. They could be from Mexico. They could be from Australia and being more conservative in how we use water and our resources in gardening with those things. Yeah, I agree with pretty much everything Cricket said, as well as, you know, making sure that you're saving, you're not just planting plants that don't require a lot of supplemental irrigation, but you're also thinking of ways to save water that comes to your yard naturally, right? So we have a ton of customers who put in dry creek beds trying to prevent runoff of water into the street. Um, we also have people who collect it from their roof, so trying to um, pretty much, it's, basically a watershed garden, um, trying to keep as much water, as much rainfall from going into our gutters and then into the ocean as possible, trying to keep it in your garden, putting it into the soil where the soil can actually clean it up and then produce, put it back um, into the watershed after it's been cleaned, right? So there's so many different ways to have a drought tolerant garden. Um, and it's not just about the plants, but it's also very much about the design and the function of your garden. So um, there's a lot of resources online. Again, you know, check out people's YouTubes and Instagrams and a lot of those landscape designers. Terramoto Landscape is really great at talking about ways that they use what's already on their landscape sites in order to, in order to create a more drought tolerant um, garden. So saving instead of saving things that are there instead of adding more things is also really important. Great, thank you all so much. I know this it wasn't enough time for us to get into all of these wonderful questions and hear more from Joanna Cricket and Katie. Um, we do wanna be respectful of everyone's time tonight. It is 6.30. Um, we will uh, follow up with a, a recap email um, with some more resources and um, the recording of tonight's webinar. Um, and please feel free to join us in August, August 4th for our next Naturehood webinar. It'll all be about firescaping. So please, please, please sign up for that webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Joanna, Cricket, and Katie. Um, you, they're, you know, all of you guys did a wonderful job and everyone is giving so much praise. I hope you're seeing all of that coming through. Um, again, big thank you. Thank you to everyone and hope you all have a great evening. Thank you, thank you. Yay, thank you.